Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest episode of the Healthcare Innovation Podcast. Uh, today, I have a special guest, uh, Dr. Dr. Akram Bhushnaki with us uh, for this episode. Uh, I've known Akram for a long time now, and I have to say, like, why I know so many people in the healthcare space globally, Akram is one of the most global individuals when it comes to healthcare. He has worked across so many different countries, brings in such a diverse range of experience. And right now he's doing something very interesting in terms of innovation at scale. So without further ado, Akram, welcome to this uh, episode. Uh, would love to maybe start with your introduction and your background for our viewers, and then we'll go into some of the questions we had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Purav. It's a pleasure to uh, to be with you today, and uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, this great program you're putting together. So, quick quick background about myself before we we discuss uh, you know important topics in in the field of healthcare. I, I guess in short, my background, I think, as you said, has always been in um, international business. From the, the get-go, my training is in, in pharmacy. I'm a doctor in pharmacy by training. I was trained in, in France at Paris University of Pharmacy. And then very early on, started a, to be attracted to international aspects of, of healthcare. Uh, so I did part of my training in Spain, in Valencia, and, and then in the United States, in, in Houston, Texas, at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And then uh, joined the industry very early on. And um, yeah, and I've been in this field for uh, close to 30 years now. Thanks, Akram, for that uh, background. Akram, uh, for our viewers, maybe it would be helpful to know a little bit more about your uh, experience. Uh, what kind of international roles did you take? Which, what geographies have you focused on? And I know it's a long list, but still an overview would be helpful. <laughs> I'll try to keep it concise, Parav. Yes, and so um, I think a couple of couple of common themes I would say. Um, I've been fortunate to join some great companies very early on. Um, I joined Glaxo, which is today GSK. It was still called Glaxo at the time, uh, to work on what was at the time the best-selling drug on the planet, Zantac, ranitidine for the treatment of ulcer. Um, so that gives you. Uh, Gives you my age and how old I am in this in this business. Um, I joined Bristol Myers Squibb after that um, and worked in oncology. BMS was at the time one of the leading companies in the oncology space uh, with a, a great innovation uh, like Taxol that really transformed the treatment of many many cancers. And so I think these are some some uh, I guess common themes where I've been fortunate enough to um, work on uh, really transformative uh, medications. Uh, for instance, uh, the treatment of ulcer was transformed by, by the discovery of Helo Helicobacter pylori. Uh, so an infection that uh, and ends up causing ulcer, ulcer disease and therefore requiring treatment by antibiotics and uh, anti-ulcer uh, therapy. So, um, and that really was a big, a big transformation. Again, Taxol and uh, the new modalities in chemotherapy were actually really, um, really impactful in, in the treatment of, of cancer. Then I joined a company uh, which was small at the time called Gilead Sciences um, and, um, and had an, an incredible journey uh, working and building uh, the commercial organization and the commercial footprint globally uh, for Gilead Sciences. Um, I joined them first in, in the United States at the headquarters in, in San Francisco and then moved to Europe, um, in France, then the UK, and then worked on all their international uh, markets. So I think these are some, some of the themes. For, um, and obviously Gilead brought such a great amount of innovations um, that really transformed the care uh, of many, many, uh, many patients. So particularly uh, treatment of HIV with the triple combination therapy combined into one pill once daily. That was a real transformation where people moved from taking a handful, literally 
a handful of, of pills and capsules every day into taking just one pill once a day and that transformed the, the care of, of HIV patients. And then later on, much later on, um, I've had the, the, the fortune to work on the hepatitis C treatment, another revolution, a cure, which is not very common, right? In infectious disease where you have a, a treatment that actually cures uh, an infection um, 100% almost. So quite, quite, yeah, yeah, quite uh, interesting and impactful uh, experiences. Totally, I can relate. And Akram, nowadays, uh, at least in our part of the world, uh, most of our viewers will be able to relate with Remdesivir because unfortunately in the COVID times, Gilead's Remdesivir has been one of the key solutions to managing critical patients. And uh, I truly appreciate the experience, right? Because what Gilead brought to the world was not just the scientific innovation, but also the innovation of access. But there is one thing to develop a cure for hepatitis C or treatment for HIV, but to make it available to six or seven billion people across different geographies and it's, it's itself an achievement. Agreed. No, I completely agree, Prof. So I think that was also, and again, I've had the great fortune of working with great mentors throughout my career. Um, starting you know at bristol myers Squibb with, with someone like benoit galley or at uh, gilead with a great gentleman uh, james saperstein i was also lucky enough to work closely with john martin uh, who sadly passed away this year uh, and norbert bishop berger and the and the incredible uh, senior management team at, at gilead i was still a young a young man at the time um but really was able to um um you know, learn so much uh, and, and, and kind of get the, the vision uh, of both, you know, working and developing great science, but at the same time thinking about how, making, how to make this science broadly available. And I think that Gilead came up with this model um, to allow for, uh, you know, the, the voluntary licensing, allowing generic manufacturers to make the drug broadly available. Uh, uh, mostly with many great Indian companies, actually. Okay, can you uh, tell that, yeah. viewers a little bit more about voluntary licensing? I'm aware of the concept, but for many, it would be very novel. People might not even be realizing that the medicine they are taking is through voluntary licensing. No, that's, that's a really good point, actually. So, so, so what it all started from the, the realization that obviously all the treatments that were developed were available in the north to summarize. And then most of the patients were actually in the south. And, and I'm particularly talking about the, the HIV epidemic. So, um, so at the time there was a thinking of how to make products broadly available. And obviously one company was not able to do it on their own to treat, you know, hundreds of millions of people. And so, uh, the, the team at Gilead came up with the idea of making the, their licenses available and doing technology transfers to manufacturers to allow for scaling up the manufacturing, reducing the costs, and, um, and then therefore allowing a very broad access. And so today there are uh, luckily hundreds of millions of people that are able to take an HIV medicine every day at an affordable cost coupled to that so there's been a, that, so that's at a company company level but there has been obviously other more institutional um, um, initiatives such as the um, medicines patent pool which basically gathered uh, all the innovator companies uh, patents and Gilead was the first one actually to join this uh, this um, patent pool and um, allowed for generic manufacturers, again, to manufacture high volume, lower costs. And then funding came through the Global Fund to allow to actually deploy uh, all this medication. Wow, well, that's quite an innovation. and It takes a lot of forward thinking to take such a step. So that's amazing. So this always brings up a question in my life. Like, 
they say in sports, right? That if you once you have won the World Cup, you're at the high of your career, and probably you retire. You should retire at such a high point. So, what was exciting enough for you to move on from there and take on your current role? Maybe if you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> No, thanks, Puram. But I, yeah, in fact, I don't think, um, yeah, for, for me, certainly a retirement is not a good recipe. Uh, I think, uh, again, there are so many things to do. And, and again, the more, the more the time passes and, and, and uh, I realize how much there is still to do. Um, again, if you look at what's happening right now around us, Puram, with the... Uh, with the COVID epidemic, right? So this has just put a huge flashlight on the absolute need to ensure equality of access to therapies. We cannot have a world where, you know, uh, some people get all the, you know, great and expensive treatment and then a majority of people have no access to treatment. Because uh, at the end of the day, we're part of the same chain. And I think that's what COVID actually made people realize, right? Um, so other epidemics were not as acute or not felt as acutely uh, globally, right? So they were very regional. And so there was huge, you know, huge uh, awareness in certain parts of the world. But obviously, COVID-19 has shown um, you know, the importance of securing uh, proper access to, 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 to drugs, proper access to innovation, etc. So that's actually how I was one of the thinking that led me to uh, uh, join another uh, great initiative, much more entrepreneurial actually, and building a, a, a business um, to precisely uh, bring innovation to emerging markets. And so that was a uh, a, an enterprise uh, we started with another great mentor and friend, Simba Gill, um, who, with with the with uh, seed money from Texas Pacific Group, and we started this company uh, that took us to uh, to Latin America, and we built a business uh, in Brazil, and then in Mexico, uh, with the idea to precisely have a platform to welcome innovations and accelerate access to, to care. So there is a, a, a common theme. And as you, as, as, uh, as you know, this is still uh, part of what I'm working on right now uh, at ALJ Health. Yeah, so come tell us a little bit more about ALJ. What's the vision? How did a group like ALJ decide to get into healthcare? What's your vision around building this business? Yeah, absolutely. So look, I think like, like many things, it all starts with an encounter. Um, and so it, it, for me, it started with, with the, the meeting of uh, Mr. Mohammed Jamil. Um, and I was very impressed with the visionary uh, uh, aspect and, uh, you know, kind of the, the enthusiasm he has in, in building true, uh, true access to, to care. Um, so there is a, the, so, so the, the, the Jamil family has a history in philanthropy, very successful one um, through, through uh, the philanthropy called Community Jamil. And um, Community Jamil has, uh, for, for instance, as, as one, one of the, the highlights has been uh, the, the support they've given to the Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT, led by uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo who have been recipients of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2019, as you well know. So obviously there is this vision that has been, uh, that has been there for many years, coupled with uh, an incredibly successful business journey uh, that uh, started in 1945, uh, that the Jamil family started in 1945. And so uh, the, the idea here is to build a state-of-the-art healthcare platform to precisely accelerate access to innovation for uh, the global south and ensuring that you know when a technology when an innovation when a drug is um is available in you know in the us in europe in japan in china um in, in other parts of the world 
it is uh, it benefits a, a broader a broader community of, of people so that's really the the vision I, I i thought that was very consistent with the way i had led my career uh, and it was a, a just a great challenge and, and adventure so we're, we're really in the middle of, of building this uh, with great partners um, so right now we're at, at really collecting and building relationships and partnerships with great, great innovator companies, as I said, from right now, mostly from the US and Japan. Um, but the goal is really to have this, this broad platform up and running uh, very soon. That's a fantastic mission, Akram, to bring some of these innovation uh, to Middle East, to Africa, to some of the Asia Pacific countries. Uh, uh, it, it, at the same time, it's, it's hard from my understanding, right? Like, these markets have its own set of challenges, its own set of financial operational limitations. And yet all this technology can make a huge change for the lives of people. So as you build this, right, uh, maybe for our, our viewers and many of them are aspiring innovators, trying to build innovative businesses, solve access challenges. Can you talk about some of the typical challenges you observe and how do you typically overcome these? No, that's a that's a that's a good point, Rav. And it's a it's a broad question, and I think challenges come in many many different uh, ways and forms, right? Um, and there are different ways to tackle them. I think um, so. Th there are different different levels when you think about um, an innovation uh, in in health, uh, and, I'm, I'm, I, and I mentioned a few, right, that I had. The opportunity to work on and deploy and build across across markets. Um, so so you, so you have the innovation, but then you have to think about what is the recipient market, what's going to be the target audience for this innovation. And um, generally, what I have seen certainly throughout my career is that you have uh, a huge diversity of uh, of contexts, right? Um, typically you will have countries or, or territories or regions that will be much more open. And, and it all, always starts with the, a, a political will, right? So there needs to be a political will at country level uh, or a regional level um, that wants to actually... Um, promote access to innovation. So at co companies can do a lot, um, and, uh, but really, and again, we're seeing it here in the COVID crisis, um, public-private partnership is a really important driver for accelerating access to innovation. Um, so a couple of examples. So uh, you look at a country like Egypt, um, great country, that has been plagued with a very high rate of, um, of uh, hepatitis C infections. And so there has been a decision at the highest level to really tackle the problem and eliminate the, the disease. And Egypt is actually well on its way to be one of the first countries with high prevalence to eliminate a disease that has been plaguing the population for, for decades. Um, Rwanda is another example. Um, and interestingly, it starts with a desire at the highest level to do something good for its population. And so I think innovators need to think along those lines. And then uh, the, the partnership part is, is a very important piece of, of, the, of, the, of the recipe. Got it, Akram. Akram, what I also we hear in general context, right, uh, is that technology now has been a great leveler. There were some of the things which were fundamentally not possible in the past when trying to sell a new service, create a new level of access. Uh, with technology, a lot of those limitations have gone away. Um, I can listen to you sitting in India. I can speak to you. I do not need to travel, like just at a very simple level. But uh, this has multiple ramifications at an individual patient level, at a community, at a country level, at a company level. Um, how are you guys leveraging the benefits of these technologies 
to try and generate more and more access no that's a that's a key key point for i and i think it's actually a unique opportunity when you think of, of it right because uh, we are at exactly at this time where you can uh, you know train people remotely where you can provide education and that's a big piece right that's one of the great limiting steps as as i certainly have observed uh, throughout my career is for instance the lack of uh, availability of trained resources to tackle certain diseases and so um, leveraging technology definitely plays a huge role in that um, the advent of digital health telemedicine teleconsultations um, are really uh, i think going to make a huge difference i don't think there we are there yet but given as you say the speed at which things evolve i think within you know the next 5 to 7 years we will see something uh, quite impactful again covid interestingly has uh, created a, a precedent right uh, where people are now consulting their physician over a screen um, and, um, and and that's becoming almost a common practice around the globe um, which was absolutely impossible to imagine only a few years ago so so i think that's that's certainly one area uh, that's from the patients point of view i think from the the other side is obviously the incredible development um in in um or the genetic side of medicine um uh, now as you see pcr is now a very standard uh, tool available in every corner uh, of the planet and i think that also will drive incredible changes uh, in terms of uh, new technologies new ways of screening for disease new ways of monitoring disease um, and and i think lots of opportunities are going to be open uh, on that front makes sense makes sense akram so akram i go to the next level of question then so with all these diverse experiences if you were to advise some of our young listeners uh, who are also aspiring to build careers within healthcare innovation i heard two important lessons one was around looking at the political way looking at the desire of different nations and then working in alignment with them not going against them second is having strong partnerships Uh, the third one is on the lines of digital uh but again these are kind of mega trends uh, at an individual level when someone's trying to shape his or her career in this what are some of the things that benefited you and you would like to pass on to our audience no it's good it's a good question i think really again looking back at the last 30 years i spent in this industry um i think there are two two big uh, two two big lessons i suppose one is the importance of um joining great schools so i think a the training the fundamental training is important right so you know focus on you know the education definitely that's 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 a prerequisite but also i think the the learning on the job in great environments um so um um it's interesting because there is a trend today for you know young people not to want to join big groups etc and want to start their own business early etc which you know is is a, is a, is a, is certainly a, an important and an interesting trend however i think that for uh many people benefiting from the experience the learnings the processes and the understanding of large groups is actually important so i wouldn't i wouldn't discount that um for sure and then also having the chance to learn from great uh, leaders um as i said so i've had the, the good fortune of uh meeting some great individuals throughout my career and um and i think that's another another important uh, important lesson obviously i mean it's obvious but but um but it's good to know it uh, walking into a you know a professional uh, career makes sense akram makes sense it's a great lesson to share akram any other uh, message that you would like to convey to our audience before we conclude this episode 
No, I think, look, we are, we, uh, the, 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 the bottom line is, I think, um, uh, healthcare is now uh, at the center of many, many uh, agendas. Um, we have seen the impact of a minuscule virus on so many industries, literally decimating, you know, tourism and and uh, airlines and um, you know and so so I think uh, now there is acute awareness if it wasn't before that uh, uh, there is a strong need for you know uh, strong healthcare systems for um, you know support to research and development for great supply chains and so that's where I think what I'm doing now typically is is you know inscribed into this this chain so um, so I think the, the, the future uh, is full of, of opportunities uh, to really fix, uh, fix, fix the world, if you want, uh, and help people. Because, um, you know, again, healthcare trends are, and, and you know this more, more than, than most, or I've given, given your, your expertise, but uh, as you can see, you know, disease profiles tend to become similar across the globe, right? Non-communicable diseases are becoming the, the norm as opposed to uh, uh, being reserved to a small portion of, of wealthy nations. Um, and so all of this is, is really opening, I think, many fields of work uh, for a young generation that, uh, you know, is coming into, into this space. Great, Akram. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really enjoyed the conversation with you. Thank you so much, Purav. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.